Uh, today I have the absolute honor to welcome Dave Zirin as our featured speaker. Zirin is the sports editor for The Nation magazine and has been named one of Utney Reader's 50 visionaries who are changing our world. He has won several journalism awards and Richard Lipsight referred to him as the best sports writer in America. He has been the host of Sirius XM Radio's popular weekly show, Edge of Sports Radio, and has been a frequent columnist and guest for Slam Magazine, The Progressive, ESPN, MSNBC, and Democracy Now. And I just recently learned that he also has felt, many of us uh, in this room, our pleasure and our pain of teaching undergraduate students. Uh, he's <laughs> currently teaching a class on sport and media and politics for a community college in Maryland. Uh, he is clearly a remarkable voice that interrogates the intersection of politics and sport and we're very lucky to have him here today. I first came across Dave's writings when I was a doctoral student at Louisiana State University uh, and I lived there during Hurricane Katrina which impacted my time living there uh, and still impacts that region today. I attended a New Orleans Saints game the season after Katrina hit and when they were uh, back playing at the Superdome. As I walked into the Superdome, I parked in the garage and walked past vacant buildings that still had windows blown out months after the hurricane. Devastation surrounded the stadium and the city was still broken and drowning in its destruction. I felt to my core that something was just not right with the continuation of a football season while New Orleans was still largely obliterated. But I did not have the words or perspective to make sense out of what I was seeing. The memory has always stayed with me. But in 2007, I came across Dave's book, Welcome to the Terror Dome. And all of a sudden, I had found a perspective that could help me better understand my troubling experience. Um, not only as a sports fan, but also as an academic. His was a perspective that I needed all along. That the relationship um, between sport and culture is messy, difficult, and not always pretty. And I think it's a perspective, like most of us in this room think, that many need. While most of us academics have a critical standpoint that we share with fellow academics and students, it can be hard to make a connection to more mainstream audiences. Dave has an incredible ability to talk to large audiences with critical perspectives that shed a light on the sports world that many outside of academia don't always see or even consider. It's my pleasure to have Dave Zirin here. Please help me welcome him. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, please give it up for, for Karen Hartman and Melissa Lee for organizing this. They're, they've been terrific. <clears throat> and I knew this would be a great conference when I heard that uh, Shireen Ahmed was going to keynote, and that's going to be absolutely amazing. Shireen, it's so great to see you. Round of applause for Shireen. Let's just keep them up. Okay. <laughs> and um, thank you. Um, you know, there, there's a question that I usually ask audiences before I speak, and with this crowd, I'm actually very curious because we're all immersed in sports, but I'm just, yeah, I wonder, how many people here consider yourselves like absolutely rabid sports fans? Okay. How many people consider yourselves casual sports fans? You know, you watch, but it's not the biggest deal in the world to you. And how many of you would rather shave your head with a cheese grater than hear somebody talk about sports for 45 minutes. Oh, great. great. Well, what's your name, if I could ask? What is it? Charlie. Charlie? Great. Well, hopefully this talk will speak to the diehard sports fan, the casual sports fan, and Charlie. If we can get that done, we'll have done something very well. Now, I grew up one of those absolute diehard sports fans, memorizing every statistic, playing whatever I could get my hands on. I mean, pretty much played every sport but golf, which of course is not a sport. Um, <laughs> this is my own personal philosophy that anything you can smoke cigarettes or gain weight while doing is not a sport. I um, 
was the starting center for my high school basketball team, which is funny in and of itself. People are already laughing because I'm not particularly tall. We were the fighting New York Friends Quakers, which is, uh, we really were. We were the fighting Quakers of New York Friends. Um, shockingly, uh, that didn't intimidate people. Um, and I never gave much thought about the politics of sports or anything that related to politics and sports. Um, I was a politics junkie, but sports was always in this separate silo. But that changed for me dramatically in college when a basketball player named Mahmoud Abdul Raouf made the private decision that he wasn't gonna come out for the national anthem. And this had this incredibly radicalizing effect on me. Like every day at 7 p.m., we would gather, you know, we didn't have phones or anything of the sorts. And we, this is something my students can't quite comprehend, like this idea that we would have to gather collectively at exactly 6.59 p.m. for the 7 p.m. Sports Center to find out the latest of what was happening with Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. It wasn't just in our hands when we wanted it. And it was quite a scene. I mean, ESPN at the time, because Raouf wouldn't come out for the national anthem, was, was drumming up the coverage in a big way. And there was this moment that particularly got inside my head when a reporter asked Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, why don't you come out there for the national anthem? Don't you realize that that flag is a symbol of freedom and democracy throughout the world? And Raouf has this look on his face like, should I say something? I think I'm gonna say something. Like it's part mischievous, part, you know, him thinking should I bite my own tongue? And then he says, well, it may be a symbol of freedom and democracy to some, but it's a symbol of oppression and tyranny to others. And when he did this, the sports world, you know, they lost their mind. Like ESPN was like, Raouf spits on the flag, booyah, din -in -it, din -in -it. And on, I was watching these shows, and on one of them, um, a, a man by the name of Dave Megacy, who was a radical football player in the 1960s, uh, who I was later able to meet, he just said one sentence that changed my life. He said, well, Raouf, I'm sure, sees himself in the tradition of activist athletes like Muhammad Ali, Billie Jean King, and so many more. And when I heard that, it was literally like, like a detonation in my brain. It's like activist athletes, what does that even mean? I had no idea that this tradition even existed. So, you know, I hit the school library. Uh, you know, there was, I couldn't Google activist athletes because Google was not a thing. So instead it was, you know, m not just microfilm, but microfiche. Oh, uh, my God. When I say this to my students, they're, they're literally like, what, what, what? Like, I might as well be talking about parchment and sundials. Um, and I found that there was this entire history, and what I learned, and this is how also I try to teach this material, is that there, there's a sports history that's based in mythology, and then there's this actual history that's much more radical and much more interesting. And just one example is the story of Jackie Robinson. Like, I, I, my dad's from Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn, uh, raised in Manhattan. And I grew up, Raymond Shuck was just talking about it in the previous session. Is, is Raymond here? That, that, was, that was terrific. And ta talking about a great detail, like the mythology of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I was raised so immersed in that. It was absurd, like my, my dad, God, he would tell the same joke all the time and people probably might have heard it. He said, what do you do if you have Walter O'Malley, you know, the person who moved the Brooklyn Dodgers to Los Angeles, what do you do if you have Walter O'Malley, Hitler and Stalin in a room and you have a gun with only two bullets? He said, you shoot O'Malley twice to make sure the bastard's dead. And that was my dad's effort at high humor. And, um, and part of the mythology of the Brooklyn Dodgers that I was raised with was the mythology of Jackie Robinson. And it was this mythology of someone who broke the color line in Major League Baseball by enduring abuse and quietly enduring abuse. And through his lone individual battle to endure abuse, he was able to integrate Major League Baseball. And you know, this is a story that's, I would argue, very pleasant for white audiences. Because there's no, nothing, you know, out, not outspoken, not making anybody uncomfortable, you know, not doing something like kneeling during the national anthem, for example, but enduring abuse. 
And it also speaks to the best angels of a white audience, that are liberal audience, that says, oh, look at the effort that this brave young man is making. This is something that now I can accept black players into the game. But what this history totally leaves out, it leaves out so much. But one of the main things it leaves out is that the story of the integration of baseball is not the story of one individual's heroic ability to endure pain put upon him by teammates and other players, but it actually comes out of the 1930s and radical mass movements against racism in this country that put the integration of Major League Baseball as a demand, as a demand. And th there are photographs of mass marches in the streets in New York that says, end Jim Crow in baseball, you know, Negroes in baseball. And I was able to learn this history uh, by meeting a gentleman who was the sports editor of the Communist Party's newspaper in the 1930s. His name was Lester Red Rodney. And Lester Rodney in the 1930s, he uh, turned the Daily Worker's sports page into this activist center where they, they would do all these remarkable stunts, like the New York Yankees would have open tryouts and they would bring black athletes to the open tryouts and dare the Yankees to turn them away or Lester Rodney, who somehow had a press pass, which is unbelievable to me, like to hang out in the dugout um, at Yankee Stadium. One time, a bunch of the reporters are interviewing this rookie by the name of Joe DiMaggio, and they say, hey Joe, uh, who's the best pitcher you ever faced? And Joe DiMaggio says, God, that would have to have been in the Pacific Coast League. It was this guy named uh, Satchel Page. And all of a sudden you could hear a pin drop, because of course Satchel Page is a black pitcher. The next day, none of the newspapers report that Joe DiMaggio said this, except in the Daily Worker with a big font, DiMaggio says Page is best, integrate baseball now, you know. And those were the kinds of things that Lester Rodney did. And fortunately, Lester Rodney, I mean, he lived to be, I believe, 98 years old, absolutely sharp as a tack, and I was able to interview him for, for hours um, in his little one-bedroom apartment in, in Oakland, California. And he just had these remarkable stories about what they did to build mass struggle to integrate baseball in the 1930s. And one time uh, he looked at me and he said, why do you even care about these stories? Why, why do you even care? And I said, because I think other people are gonna care about this too because this is erased history. So I wanna go out and talk to people about this stuff. And he said, ah, to be 80 again, which I thought was very cute. Um, and then there's the story of, of Jackie Robinson himself, because that image of the lone fighter, I mean, and the image that's been, I think, consecrated in history and in films like 42, uh, it, it's so painful because Jackie Robinson left behind us a pretty remarkable uh, political legacy in terms of columns that he wrote for the New York Post, uh, which was like this amazing political sports column that he did, speeches he made about the civil rights movement. He left behind a legacy of the written word. And one of the statements that he makes and one of his common themes is, please don't think, uh, he would use the word Negroes. He would say, please don't think Negroes in this country have it made just because I was able to make it. I'm not concerned with me as an individual. I'm concerned about how the mass is doing. So he always counterposed the narrative of him as exceptional individual with how are we doing more generally. And yet despite that, the mythos of him as the individual who did it was something that was more powerful than even his ability to push back against it. And one of the things that I found remarkable in, in one book I read was that, uh, that Jackie Robinson was the most requested speaker by southern branches of the NAACP during the 1950s, during the height of the King era of the Civil Rights Movement. I always found that so interesting because the number two most requested speaker was someone named Martin Luther King. And I always found that interesting because you imagine people organizing a political rally and they get together and they say, okay, who can we get? Can we get Jackie Robinson? Ah, oh, he's busy. All right, let's get Dr. King. Oh, I can't believe we gotta settle for Dr. King. I mean, the idea that Dr. King was like the second choice. And Jackie Robinson, he would always end his speeches. He had this great applause line that speaks to that counterposition of the individual and the mass, where he would say, if I had to choose between baseball hall of fame and full citizenship for my people, I would choose full citizenship time and again. And this would bring the crowd to their feet. Now, that's not the Jackie Robinson 
that I was taught. And it, it's a much more, it's much a different, much more different kind of image of Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson is also often put in a narrative of, of like the patriot, of the Republican, because he was a member of the Republican Party at a time where the Democrats were the Dixiecrats. And, and then, but then they leave out the part where he made speeches in the 1960s, where like when he went to the Republican convention, as the Republican Party was shifting towards a more, I would argue, racist agenda in the wake of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, Jackie Robinson went to the Republican National Convention in 1964 and he left and he said, now I know how Jews must have felt in Nuremberg. And so he, he was very direct about what he felt and he also, at the end of his life, this is always left out of the narrative of Jackie Robinson, he said, I cannot stand and sing the anthem, I cannot salute the flag, I know that I am a black man in a white world in 1972, in 1947, at my birth in 1919, I know that I never had it made. Now, Jackie Robinson still was like this image and this figure of the black athlete in the 1950s. But I'll just say very briefly, a figure we don't hear about, who I think augured what was known as the revolt of the black athlete in the 1960s, is a woman named uh, Rose Robinson, who in 1959, she was a triple jumper, and Rose Robinson, by the way, no relation to Jackie Robinson. And I learned about Rose Robinson from, uh, first and foremost, from the Burn It All Down podcast, which Shireen is one of the hosts of, by the way, and one of the academics on that podcast, Amira Rose Davis, uh, who's done great work about Rose Robinson. And Rose Robinson, she wouldn't stand for the national anthem um, in protest of the Cold War and the military buildup and the possibility of you know, nuclear annihilation. So she's like, I'm not gonna stand for the flag. And, Rose Robinson, in a lot of ways, to me, um, doing this on an international stage as a triple jumper is a precursor uh, to what you see in the 1960s with, I think, one of the most over-mythologized athletes that we have, and that's, of course, uh, Muhammad Ali. Now, how many people here teach Muhammad Ali, out of curiosity? Okay, interesting. See, I, I love teaching Muhammad Ali. I love it for so many reasons. I mean, not the least of which is, um, the students, like, like they, 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 they get wired into it right away. As soon as, you know, he's on screen and he's like, you know, I hospitalized a rock, I beat up a brick, I'm so bad I make medicine sick, ah! And my students are like, that's awesome. I, <laughs> I want to learn about this guy. But the way they, what they know about, I always ask, what do you know about him before we start doing a, an Ali section? And one of the things they say is certainly one of the things that the way I was taught about Muhammad Ali, which is completely decontextualized from the 1960s. And it's this idea that Ali somehow came down from planet awesome just to be this incredibly uh, eloquent, rhyming uh, person who opposed the war in Vietnam and uh, he was against racism and, and he, he was just almost like this incredibly singular person who exists outside of time and space. And what I, what I try to teach them is like, look, if the 1960s don't happen, Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr., uh, he fulfills his lifelong dream, which was to bring the showmanship of professional wrestling into boxing. And if you'd asked him who his hero was, he would have said Gorgeous George, who was a professional wrestler at that time. And yet the 1960s happened and they collided uh, with his worldview, particularly uh, people know the story, which may or even may not be true, but it's the story of him coming back from the Olympics in 1960 with a gold medal around his neck, not being able to be served a cheeseburger at a restaurant in Ohio, and him throwing, I'm sorry, no, it was in Louisville, Kentucky, and then him throwing his gold medal into the Ohio River. And, you know, there, it's so interesting that, like, um, NBC did this big report in the 96 Olympics when Ali lit the torch that, oh no, he didn't really throw his medal into the river, that's not true. But then Ali himself said later, no, I did throw it into the river and it's this idea of making him, you know, sanding off his edges or extracting his political teeth as the mainstream media will do. But, but the thing that, that I think really blows my students' mind is when I say like, no, let's listen to the political Ali, let's not listen to the rhymes Let's listen to what he was actually saying politically, and that only that way can you understand why he was so hated, but also why he's so treasured. And this is just a, a section of a speech that Ali once gave when um, he was refusing his draft status in the Vietnam War, and they were taking away his title. Uh, and this is what he said. He said, 
Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? This is the day when such evils must come to an end. I've been warned that to take such a stand would cost me millions of dollars, but I've said it once and I'll say it again. The real enemy of my people is here. I'll go to jail. So what? We've been in jail for 400 years. And so there you see Muhammad Ali, what he's doing, which is so uh, amazing and catalytic at this time. And this is really, I think, why his importance is so important to remember, is that he's taking these two movements that define the 1960s, the anti-war struggle and the black freedom struggle, which oftentimes existed on, certainly in the early 60s, on parallel tracks. And he's putting one foot in each. And this is as the most famous person on earth. And so when I say my, athlete, uh, my, my, my students, I'm like, so who's an athlete today who you think gets a lot of crap from the media or whatnot? And you know, the answers they give are you know, Kevin Durant and things like that. And I was like, look, <laughs> you're not comparing Kevin Durant to Muhammad Ali. Like, like this is the perspective of what this person actually had to deal with. And his influence was so profound. Like, uh, when Martin Luther King uh, came out against the war in Vietnam in 1967 with his amazing Riverside Church speech, which I, I, I print out and give to my students to read because I think it's just one of the most beautiful speeches in American political life, um, people don't realize that before that speech, people asked him, the media was pressing King because they thought that him coming out against the war in Vietnam was, it was incredibly foolhardy for him to do that it would repel all his friends in Congress and it would, it would stall civil rights legislation. And Martin Luther King said, well, it's like Muhammad Ali teaches us these issues are connected. So you have Martin Luther King actually like summoning Muhammad Ali as a way to justify his own anti-war stance. Uh, similarly, Nelson Mandela, like he, that was one of his first stops when he came to the United States after uh, finally getting out of prison with the fall of apartheid was he visited Muhammad Ali before visiting the US president because he said when Muhammad Ali fought, I felt like the walls in Robben Island were coming down. And Ali's influence was also felt in this image right here, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And it's such a fun image to teach from the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. Because the first thing I always say to my students is like, I say, how many of you know this moment? And even like, like my students, some of whom, to, to reference something Karen said, some of whom like do not know what Hurricane Katrina is. You know, that's before their time in, in their minds. And sometimes I have to remind myself that, yeah, that was 14 years ago. It feels like, like it could be yesterday. But, but it's, like, so, so it's like some basic US political history um, are just things that they weren't taught, and yet they all know this image. And they all raise their hand, and I say, people might know this moment 1968 Olympics, Mexico City, but they don't realize that it was a movement called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And part of this movement was a fight to uh, boycott the Olympics by black athletes and any allies who wanted to join with them um, as a way to showcase uh, racism in the United States. Uh, one of their slogans was, why should we run in Mexico City only to crawl home? And they had a series of demands that they were putting forward to the International Olympic Committee. And tops on their list was restore Muhammad Ali's title. And they called him the warrior saint of the black athletes revolt. They also called for Avery Brundage, the head of the IOC, otherwise known as Slavery Avery, to step down. They wanted more black coaches hired. Uh, and they wanted South Africa and Rhodesia disinvited from the Olympics. And part of the story that often isn't, often isn't told is that South Africa and Rhodesia then were disinvited from the 68 games. And that also played a role, that was because of their activism, but it also played a role in undercutting uh, the boycott. So they just, but Tommy Smith and John Carlos uh, decided that they needed to do something, that they actually, they had to do something to show the legacy of the struggle, to show the legacy of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And this is where I point out on the photo that people see the fists and the gloves, but maybe don't realize that they're also not wearing shoes uh, to, as a symbol of poverty in the United States, that they're also wearing beads around their necks as a symbol of lynching in the United States. And that the, the third person up there who people look at and sometimes think is like Forrest Gump or something, like just standing there like, oh wow, history. Um, you know, that's their ally, Peter Norman, who's also wearing a button 
that says Olympic Project for Human Rights. And so they brought all this stuff to the games, uh, the beads and the gloves, but of course, what they have to do first, they had to win. And this is where I think this is just a fascinating story because it, it I, I did a book with John Carlos, um, his, his memoir, and the story as he tells it, and it's backed up by videotape, if you watch video of the race itself, is, is so amazing because, you know, there's, there's this ethos that's taught in sports that's pounded into us from when we're, we're kids. And I coach youth sports and, you know, I succumb to it myself, which is this idea that, you know, winning is the most important thing and that's, you know, what you have to go for, you have to do your best, and there aren't concerns outside of this incredibly narrow framework of victory and defeat. And yet when you watch this race, John Carlos gets out to a big lead. It's a 200 meter race. You run 200 meters, your eyes are only supposed to be forward. And he's constantly looking backwards over his left shoulder for Tommy Smith. Like so for him winning the gold medal was less important than making sure that they were both on this podium together. So they're playing games with hundredths of a second, trying to figure out how they can both get on this podium at the same time. With the, with the gold and the silver medal. And that's actually one of the unintended parts of history is that John is looking over his shoulder so much for Tommy, he doesn't realize that Peter Norman's coming on the other side and actually won the silver medal and John wins the bronze. And if you watch the video of it in super slow-mo, you could see John looking back at Tommy as Tommy goes past him. And then there's Peter right over there. So he's like, yeah, oh shit. And, <laughs> and they both, and, but they, but they were on the podium and that's all that mattered and they, they embraced and then they got ready for this moment. And you know, as they're walking to the podium, and this is just an, a way to, to teach about the broader 60s to, to my class, like as they're going to the podium, uh, Tommy looks at John and he says, what if we get up there and somebody tries to shoot us? And, and I say to my class, I was like, are they out of their minds? Are they being paranoid? You know, what do we know about October 1968 and the year that was? And then, you know, we start to talk about Martin Luther King assassinated, Robert Kennedy assassinated. Then we talk about the story that no one usually knows about, about the hundreds of Mexican workers and students who were massacred before the start of these Olympics. And they knew about that. They were very aware of what had happened in Mexico City. So this idea of them getting shot for doing this was not so crazy. And so John told me he looked at Tommy and he said, well, you know, we're trained to listen for the gun. So maybe it won't be so bad. <laughs> we can move pretty quickly. It was his little joke to break the tension. Um, and then when they got up there, John said it got so quiet, you could have heard a frog piss on cotton. That was his description. And then they endured all kinds of abuse. But you know, one of the people who offered them solidarity from, the, from an older generation, and that was rare. And that's worth saying too, the black press was not happy with them for doing this. Older generation of black athletes, people like Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens, furious of them for doing this. Young people who were radicals, black and white, were electrified. I spoke to uh, a young uh, Air, uh, Air Force cadet who in 1968 was, uh, was stationed, I think he was still in Colorado Springs, and uh, trying to figure out his way politically. And when he saw this, it absolutely, he said it electrified him and changed his life. That, that Air Force, uh, I don't, do you call them cadets? Well, that Air Force student was named Greg Popovich. And so for Popovich, this was like, like nothing he'd ever seen before and it changed him. But one person from that older generation who stood with them was Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson said, he said, look, you know, I, they're brave. And maybe if we, and this is Jackie Robinson saying this, he said, maybe if we had been more brave in the 40s and 50s, they wouldn't have to do this now. So actually he's cutting against this idea that he did it the right way. He was saying, no, maybe we didn't do it the right way because we still have these issues and these young men have to do this today. So. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking a lot. I am talking a lot. How am I doing? Am I doing okay? All right, I'm talking a lot about uh, race and racism in sports. Um, but I, I also use sports as a way 
to teach about, like, because I think sports can be used to teach about the history of women in the United States very easily. Like, if you look at the position of women in sports relative uh, to their position in society, it tells the story unto itself. Like, one of the things I always ask my students is I say, why do you think women's tennis is best of three sets instead of best of five? And oftentimes they give answers that are kind of, I would, I would describe it as sexist and uh, sexist. Like they would, they, they, that's probably the best way. They say like, well, it's because, you know, it's like they can't handle best of five. That's why it's best of three sets. That does not make perfect sense. And I tell them, well, actually, early Wimbledon, if you look up the scores, it was best of five sets. And yet women at Wimbledon, they were playing wearing corsets. They had to wear corsets to play and they're passing out on the court. And the people who ran Wimbledon got together and they said, what are we gonna do about this? Someone's gonna die at Wimbledon. No one, people can't breathe. And they thought about it and they said, should we get rid of the corsets? They said, no, let's keep the corsets, but let's make it best of three sets instead of best of five. And then everybody will be happy. And the corset remained until a remarkable 15-year-old Wimbledon champion named Lottie Dodd uh, went and made a plea to the Wimbledon organizers saying that the competition would have been so much better if my opponents had been able to breathe. And Lottie Dodd is a, is a great story unto herself, but that's maybe a separate line of conversation. Um, but what I try to also talk to my students about is like to get them to understand that sports was something that women were just denied at the turn of the 20th century. And the forces that, that allied against women from even being able to play sports, I mean, it was, it was the church, it was uh, institutions of medicine. I mean, it, it was an overwhelming tidal wave saying, no, you cannot play. And oh, by the way, here's some clothes that prevent you from breathing as well. And uh, one of the things I, I read to them, just because it makes them chuckle, is this uh, from the 1878 edition of the American Christian Review, uh, the 12-step downfall of any woman who dared engage in the sinful world of croquet. And it, it truly is a slippery slope. And I just, I want people to hear the hysteria in this. So they, they break it down, they go, step one, social party. Step two, social and play party. Step three, croquet party. Step four, picnic and croquet party. Step five, picnic, croquet, and dance. Step six, absence from church. Step seven, immoral conduct. Step eight, exclusion from the church. Step nine, this one's my favorite, more croquet. <laughs> so it's like, well sure, you're excluded from church. What else are you gonna do? Step 10, poverty, which is a hell of a leap. Because when I, I don't associate cro croquet with poverty, like the, the poor wastrels the Cockney boot blacks playing croquet. Um, step 11, shame and disgrace. And step 12, ruin. And you thought it was just croquet. And it also you know, wasn't, of course, just the church. Um, the, the Journal of American Medicine, uh, they, they said that any women who dared ride a bicycle was in danger of getting what they called the bicycle face which they described as consisting of, quote, a protruding jaw, wild staring eyes, and a strained expression. Basically, you look like Dick Cheney, I guess, if you ride a bicycle. And the bicycle, though, represented this incredible threat to the social order, precisely because it provided women with, with exercise, you can't wear a corset when you ride a bicycle, and a freedom of movement, and it was such a big deal. Susan B. Anthony has a, has a quote where she says, uh, the invention of the bicycle has done as much or more for women's liberation than I ever could. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, when we win the right to vote, it'll be riding a bicycle. And so th there's this push and pull against that. And so much of the push against women playing sports, I mean, was informed about fear of, of female sexuality and female leadership. It's all tied together, because that's what sports were supposed to instill in men was heteronormative activity and the ability to lead a new American century. And women were not supposed to be involved in those categories uh, of advancement, and so they, they lined up against sports. But then you see throughout the 20th century, as women make advances 
to uh, lead in society, there are also advances in the world of sports. And of course, you don't see this any more dramatically than in the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, which accompanies the passage of Title IX. So it's no coincidence you have the emergence of people like Billie Jean King and the emergence of Title IX legislation. This stuff goes um, absolutely hand in hand. Now, obviously the reason why I want to talk about this stuff is because um, all of this, I mean, it's a living history, and it's really come back with a vengeance, a uh, beautiful vengeance, call it the revenge of history, like since Colin Kaepernick took that knee uh, in the fall of 2016. And yet, of course, it didn't start with Colin Kaepernick, just as Roseanne Robinson in 1959 presaged Muhammad Ali, it started with the incredible heroism of black women, uh, particularly a woman named Ariana Smith and uh, women in the WNBA, who before Colin Kaepernick took that knee, uh, were bringing the issues that were being raised by the Black Lives Matter movement into the world of sports. And basically making the same argument that was being made by Tommy Smith and John Carlos, which they said, why should we run in Mexico City only to crawl home? They were saying, if, you're, if we're good enough to cheer, then you also need to listen to what it is we're trying to say. And if this makes you uncomfortable, then so be it. But you know, we're not gonna have this relationship between sports and society where you get to clap for us when we're on the field, but when we're off the field and we're out of uniform, we're in danger, our children are in danger. Um, we are gonna raise these issues and we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna raise them in a way that changes the world. And I think it has changed the world. In the recent years, the discussions that have opened up around sports and politics have been amazing. Like when I started doing talks like this, uh, probably like back in 2005, I would always try to end by talking about like, hey, it's a living tradition. Sports and politics, it's still alive today. And people would be like, yeah, right. You know, and I would have to be like, no, there's a backup center on the Golden State Warriors who's really into campaign finance reform. <laughs> True, his name is Adon Donald Foyle. Or I would speak about um, a backup center for the Washington Wizards named Tom Thomas, and he's really, really upset about the death penalty. And therefore, the tradition lives. And people would say, you know, Dave, that's kind of a thin gruel compared to Muhammad Ali and Billie Jean King and the rest. But I think people like Atan Thomas, like uh, <laughs> Donald Foyle, what, what they did was they kept the flame alive uh, throughout these years. And this idea that there is a proud tradition in the world of sports, a proud tradition of sports and activism that today um, really is becoming something that is moving mountains on every level. And I think the Kaepernick and the taking of the knee during the anthem phenomenon, I mean, is something that's gonna stand the test of time. I mean, because of course it's not just a story of Colin Kaepernick doing this. It's a story of, I mean, I don't know about folks here, but like at my high school, even at my little Quaker high school, the sports teams were where the, rea uh, male sports teams to be clear, were where the, were, hi Richard. Uh, Oh, <laughs> the sports teams were where the reactionaries congregated. And at my college, like if people were particularly <laughs> reactionary, they, they would find their place um, on the sports teams, the men's sports teams. And you know, like the, the, the parties they would throw, all the things like that were, were not necessarily opening and welcoming spaces. Um, but what you saw after Colin Kaepernick took a knee is all of a sudden the sports field becomes a place of visible resistance to racism and visible resistance to Donald Trump. I mean, you have men's and uh, women's volleyball teams, men's soccer teams, certainly men's football teams taking a knee during the anthem. I mean, you even had in Oakland, uh, the band came out and did the national anthem at a high school game and they all took a knee as they finished the anthem. And one of the people was holding a zuzaphone, which I think was probably far more athletic than anything you'd see on the field, like taking a knee while holding a, a zuzaphone. If you know what a zuzaphone is, it's like a, a tuba's mean cousin. And, so it's, it's really, it's an, an amazing thing. There's, um, they, they, they make the kids at my, uh, my son's elementary school stand for uh, the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. And this friend of uh, my, my son's, he started taking a knee during the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, he's 10 years old. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, uh, I heard about it and I went up to him and I said, so oh, you're taking a knee during, and he said, why are you taking a knee? And he said, because I hate racism. And I said to him, well, you're also doing it kind of because of Colin Kaepernick and you think Kaepernick's cool? And he looked at me and he said, who's Colin Kaepernick? 
And to me, it just showed that this, this is bigger than sports, and it's transcended sports, and it's become something that has provided a, a kind of literacy in social activism through sports that otherwise in this era we simply would not have. And that makes it dangerous. And that's why you have companies like Nike trying to co-opt it with woke advertising and commodifying dissent. And that's why you have people like Donald Trump trying to crush it. And this is the story of what I would argue they always do to activist leaders. You either commodify it or you destroy it. You either pull out their political teeth or you consign them to the forgotten whole of history. You either turn them into Muhammad Ali, the walking saint, or you turn them into Rose Robinson and you become forgotten without the, the work of intrepid scholars to revive their memories. And I think this history is so important because I really do stand with the, the words of uh, the late historian Howard Zinn, uh, who said, you know, I study history not because I want to change the past, but because I want to change the future. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time. Happy to take any questions that people have, or if there are no questions, we can uh, drink. <laughs> so, you have to swing the camera to yourself now, right? <laughs> These weren't designed for selfies, oh. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, my question for you, and I'm actually fascinated with the image, but I've been more fascinated probably the last year since I've learned more about Peter Norman. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, I know that Carlos and Smith were Paul Bearers at his funeral and they're connected, but I'm wondering from your talks with Carlos, mm -hmm. what insight can you give us about Peter Norman? Because I think his, yeah. his narrative is so smothered in all of this, and I think it's such a fascinating uh, link to U.S. history that's never told here because he's not American. Right, no, that's a great question. It, it's also, a, a, to tell his story is kind of threatening because it, it's, it's a remarkable symbol of what true allyship looks like, which isn't something we're necessarily taught. So, and this is something, this is one of the reasons why John Carlos, uh, you want to make John Carlos mad, he once stopped an interview on CNN when they said, tell us about the black power salute, and he said, he said, look, I'm all for black power, but it wasn't meant to be a black power salute. It was meant to be an all power to the people salute. And he said to me, and he said to CNN, I don't know if this got on the air actually, because they, they were kind of like, all right, let's go to commercial. But he says like, when you make it about black power, what you're also doing is you're separating it so other people can't draw inspiration from it and feel like they have a role in the resistance. And it, it's a remarkable display. Like Peter Norman isn't asking to put his fist up too. He's not asking to take their moment, but he is resolutely standing with them. And he paid a terrible price for it. I mean, some, some facts about Peter Norman is his, uh, a couple, the basic things to know is that when Australia was like a deeply, deeply reactionary country at the time with regards to, to race. And Peter Norman's family, uh, they were part of uh, the Salvation Army. And so they would travel and do good works and try to break down the segregation that exists in Australia. So Peter Norman grew up in a much more um, integrated environment, a much more multicultural environment than maybe somebody, a typical white Australian track star would grow up in. And he told his stories about the Salvation Army to Carlos and Smith before the race, and they felt this affinity to him right away, that, oh, this is someone who stands with us not knowing that he would get the silver medal. And, but when he got the silver medal, the first thing he tried to do was take John Carlos's button because he said, I want people to know from history that I stood with you guys. And John Carlos said, whoa, 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 you can't have my button. You gotta find your own. And the people who had the buttons were interestingly the US Olympic crew team, which was all made up of Harvard University students. And they were all white and they p issued a statement where they were like, we stand with the black athletes revolt as Harvard crew <laughs> competitors. But, but, they, but they were the ones who actually made those patches, made those buttons, and they were ha handed them out to whoever wanted them, and that's where uh, Peter Norman got his patch. 
And when Peter Norman returned home to Australia, I mean, he suffered terribly. And the way John tells it is he, he's, this is John's sort of line about it, is he says, like when um, at home, at least John and, uh, at least Tommy and I had each other. Peter had nobody in Australia. And he was ostracized from the track community. He was uh, really abandoned, left on his own. He couldn't find work. Uh, I mean, it was so entrenched that he was left, even though he was the most successful uh, male track athlete in the history of Australia, uh, he was left out of the commemorations and celebrations at the 2000 Olympics that, that they hosted. I mean, it was, it was that entrenched. And there, there's a great column that was written by uh, Mike Wise who like had to track down Peter Norman in 2000 just to talk to him. So he really suffered. But the best Peter Norman story I can give was when, um, has anyone here ever seen the statues at San Jose State of, of Smith and Carlos? Well, when you see the statues, you see, there's just incredible, it's an incredible work of art, but when you see the statues, you see that uh, the Peter Norman place is actually empty, that nobody's there. And when John Carlos first saw the design for the statues, he was furious, and he went, he went to the, um, the head of the school, the school president's office, and said, I'm not going to support this, and I'm going to embarrass you very much by saying I don't support this statue if Peter Norman's not up there either. And the school president said, let's get Peter Norman on the phone right now, because I think you need to hear what he has to say. And Peter Norman got on the phone, and what he said was, he said, John, I asked to not be part of the statue, because I want other people to be able to stand there and experience what I experienced that day in Mexico City. And to this day, when there are political protests at San Jose State, you know, this is where people gather, at the statue. And when people have to give talks or speeches, they stand in the Peter Norman spot to give those speeches. So, and I just think that says so much about Peter Norman, and his character, and who he is. And I'm sorry, that was a very long answer, but it is a really good question. There's also a very good documentary called Salute about Peter Norman that was done by his nephew. So. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, it's, it's one of those things of, of using the, these tools that society bestows. I mean, I mean we're, we're taught to venerate athletes, so athletes get this platform. And I think more and more athletes are thinking to themselves, all right, well, I've got this platform anyway. How am I going to use it? And what am I going to say with this platform? And I think the presence of social media has been a game changer, in addition to factors like uh, the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and the dependence on black bodies and U.S. sports. Like in, in addition to that, I think the Me Too movement and the way that's impacting sports. So, in addition to the presence of actual real-life movements off the field, I think social media has been a game changer in terms of like applying pressure to these athletes to take the blinders off. I mean, I think social media has been absolutely an essential for if people have witnessed the political evolution of LeBron James to somebody as an outspoken athlete. I mean, so much of that has come through social media for him. I mean, even like there's this iconic picture of him wearing the I Can't Breathe shirt. Like the whole background story about how he even wore that shirt was because Derrick Rose wore one and LeBron James commented, like, I'd wear one if I had one and a player named Jared Jack saw it on Twitter and then showed up at the Cleveland uh, locker room the next night where they were playing the Nets and had like a stack of them and Kyrie Irving wore them and other players wore them. So I mean, I think, um, I think social media has been uh, a place for athletes also to find their voice because there's still a ton of distrust with what is you know, an overwhelmingly older white sports media and a lot of these young athletes, the distrust is real. And so athletes being able to have their own, 
their own venue, their own platform, their own ability to be heard has been has been huge. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're a pretty impatient society right now, too. I would argue that's very true. <laughs> we're a microwave society. I, I certainly hope so. Um, I feel like Colin Kaepernick is still growing. I think people get very impatient with him without realizing that so much of what he's done was kind of thrust upon him and something that he didn't expect. And I think everybody, you know, but people have their own pace in terms of how they develop. Um, I certainly do hope there's patience for it because uh, the alternative is that people retreat into their shells when they make the slightest misstep. And just a quick point about Ali that you mentioned. First of all, I think Ali would have mastered Twitter in, in, in a moment. I think that would have been just s such an easy layup for him. But the, um, to mix my sports metaphors, but the, the, the thing about Ali also is, you're absolutely right, there's a great documentary, I just want to recommend it, called The Trials of Muhammad Ali, and they, um, they look at his speeches that he was giving early in 1968 on college campuses and they counterpose that with the speeches that he was giving at the end of 1968, and he developed. He, he, he gave hundreds of speeches that year, I mean, because he was banned from boxing, and the Nation of Islam had shunned him as well that year, so it was just him and his wife, Khalila, going to college campus to college campus, and he um, developed remarkably as a speaker. And it's weird, like I've seen that, I've been to a couple of the events that Colin Kaepernick has put on for kids and I've seen him develop as a speaker too. Like he's really smart, he's also really uh, kind of shy as a personality. And I've seen him develop too, but it's like these events are like closed camera, like there aren't cameras there, they're not, there's nothing that's gonna go online. And um, I think there's gonna come a time though when he does emerge so maybe that's one way to do it too, is you, you develop in a more private circumstance. This may go to something you've already mentioned too, but I, I, I and it, was, it hasn't been, I guess, really, really publicized, but um, Kaepernick being asked to join the new Alliance Football League and declining, and there was reports mm -hmm. that he you know, only wanted $20 million. It, I just wanted your take, is there anything to Maybe why he didn't want to play? Does it fit into him being shy, or is there anything even is that just media blown oh. out of proportion kind of thing? Yeah, th there was there was a lot of media sort of BS around that. Nothing. I mean, all I know is that nothing was ever confirmed by Kaepernick's camp, either the offer um, or the refusal. But I know that the number one thing is that as a point of principle, you know, he thinks he should be playing in the National Football League, and not just because people like Blaine Gabbert continue to get jobs. Which is, uh, Sorry, Char Charlie Blaine Gabbert really sucks. Just putting that, just putting it out there, um, and, and and so so it has become this thing where he's still training uh, five six days a week. He's still working out, um, and he's still living his life as if that call is going to come. And it's become like this point of political principle. So Dave, thanks again for. I'm going to hold it back here because I have a big voice. Uh -huh. uh, I thanks again for coming and speaking to us. Oh, thank um, you. I really appreciate that. I, I think w the difference between the time periods is that M Muhammad Ali acted as the lightning bolt, as the lightning rod for, which gave cover um, mm -hmm. to guys like the, uh, to the Carlos. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so I worry about LeBron because his mm -hmm. commercial interests are so large, whether he can be the lightning rod. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he took a shot at the president uh, about, you know, you bum. They, they already disinvited themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, back during the Twitter um, fiasco with him and Trump, and you had Laura Ingram and others say, shut up and play basketball. Mm -hmm. I like that he is becoming that guy. Mm -hmm. I just worry about how far he can go because his commercial interest with him producing TV shows and the like is gonna probably pull him back a little bit. Mm. I mean, it's interesting. He's trying to create a new template uh, of the activist mogul and it'll be fascinating to see if he can pull it off. Like, he's, he's, there's gonna be a Muhammad Ali documentary called What's My Name that LeBron produced that's gonna be out next month, 
And I'm really curious to see that because he's already lent that acts of activist mogul patina to uh, th this shut up and dribble documentary that he did, which was, which was really good if people got to see it in terms of going into some of the activism in the NBA. But it also, it, it, was, it was more storytelling than radical critique um, of, of people like David Stern, the former commissioner and things like that, or, or a structural critique. Uh, but there's, he's trying to do it differently. And um, it's, gonna be, it's just gonna be very interesting to see if he's able to pull it off. I think already he's succeeded though as, as in terms of being that lightning rod, um, in terms of being this person who, because he speaks out, it actually then pressures the entire NBA industrial complex to actually accept activist players and outspoken players. And, um, and I think it goes for the WNBA as well. Like they, there's this, it's like there's this thing, it's like, well, if LeBron is doing it, and similarly in the WNBA, like arguably their greatest player is someone named Maya Moore, who's been outspoken on the question of criminal justice reform. It's like these, when, when these players are willing to speak out, it allows the person who's on the bench who might care about politics to speak. And I think already LeBron's been really successful in putting down this template that it's okay to be politically active. Um, Howard Bryant put it really well. He, he, in one article, he wrote that uh, if there's some terrible uh, injust, racial injustice that happens in the world, like 20 years ago, it would have been shocking if Michael Jordan had had something to say about it. Today, it would be shocking if LeBron James has nothing to say about it. And that, that's a big difference. Can one be an activist mogul? We'll find out. I don't know. So I'm, gl I'm glad that you talked about the WNBA because I think they kind of get overshadowed a lot with, I mean, because they were doing things before Kaepernick and after mm -hmm. and, and other things. There's a lot of instability in the WNBA right now. They don't have a, they don't have a, a, a president and mm -hmm. they, they're, they're opting out of the contract mm -hmm. and that's going to be up for renewal. Do you think if there is, you know, instability within the WNBA, do you think that cuts against the activism or the attention on activism by some of the players? And I, obviously Maya Moore is not playing in the league this year. Right, which oh. is bad for several reasons. I'm a, I'm a Lynx fan, so I am, we are yeah. very sad about that, but we understand <clears throat> why. But I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. No, I, I mean, I could be very wrong about this. Um, I'd be curious what your thoughts are, honestly. I mean, I, I feel like what I've seen is, is more, I mean, Brianna Stewart just said some really outspoken stuff. Um, and I, I just feel like that in a lot of ways it's, it's making them stand up for their sport more and, and actually calling out things like uh, media coverage, uh, promotion, the NBA's commitment. I mean, there's this whole discussion that started this last like six months about pay disparities and how we understand them and how they understand revenue sharing. And that, that debate and discussion was driven by WNBA players. And so it, it, makes me, it makes me hopeful that some of the, the instability that you describe actually generates them to act, stand up and be more outspoken in that context because they, they, they see the future of their league and their sport at stake and they want it built on the right kind of grounds. It, they, you know, it was like $25 tickets to go to the All-Star game, mm -hmm. and that, but it was just the game. That was nothing else in terms of other ways to kind of promote the league. Mm -hmm. You have like the best players in the women's game in Minneapolis, and that's a good fan base. Yeah. So it'd be interesting in Vegas this summer if maybe they try to do more. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, last summer, I mean, they had commercials that were like pro, they were giving money to Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and having commercials about activism and feminism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't getting as much discussion in like kind of more the mainstream sports media. Oh yeah, I wrote about that though. Yeah. That, was, that, was amazing. that was a Seattle storm. Did that like in conjunction with the team's management. That was amazing. And also I would say Springfield, Massachusetts doesn't do a good job either. I mean, that's a really important base. That's where the Basketball Hall of Fame is. That's a really important base to promote the women's game and it's, it's lacking. And I think we have just enough time for one or two more questions. I know we've talked a lot about players and athletes who have taken strong positions on sports, but uh, some years ago I remember reading a, an obituary about Dean Smith, who mm -hmm. was the men's basketball coach for a long time at North Carolina University. 
and I was very surprised to learn how what an activist he was mm -hmm. and how progressive he was and the, the stands that he took at risk to his own career. And it got me thinking about what other coaches or owners mm -hmm. are out there who are taking similar stands publicly like he did. So it got me thinking about you know some of the coaches and, and, and teams I support, what their politics are. We're mm -hmm. rarely told anything about uh, what they support or, or whatever. Who is the Dean Smith or who are the Dean Smiths of today? Oh, it's Greg Popovich and, and, and Steve Kerr. The Golden State Warriors have been some of the more outspoken people. Um, shockingly, you haven't seen this too much in the world of the NFL uh, in terms of the coaches there. Um, but, but, you know, in the NBA you have. It's not just him. David Fisdale has said of the coach of the Knicks. I mean, when uh, Alvin Gentry, um, Mike D'Antoni, when anti-immigrant legislation was being levied in Arizona and all the Phoenix players wore jerseys that said Los Sons on Cinco de Mayo, and there was a march before the game on the stadium. And so, so I think, and again, I really do think this is the LeBron effect, to get back to the earlier point, that in basketball, like people do feel like they have this cover to say what they think. And um, in baseball, Culturally, there's very little space for anybody to say or do anything or else they're gonna get hit in the head uh, with a ball. And in, in football, of course, is a story unto itself um, in, in terms of how it views any sort of transgressive politics um, whatsoever. So, yeah, like the, the, the coaches are out there. And interestingly, just uh, yesterday, Gino Oriema, we were talking about um, women's basketball at UConn, he said the players need to get paid. And that's an incredibly high-ranking voice uh, speaking out against the way the NCAA does its economics. And so, so the voices are out there. And, um, and I think for more and more coaches, it shows a kind of leadership that's sorely lacking. Uh, and I know John Carlos, like he, he's open to coming to college campuses and speaking to teams. And we put out a big call for that. And it was amazing like how few the coaches wanted this person who's so synonymous with rebellion to actually talk to their team. But the ones who did, it's like, you know, like they, they have a special place in my heart because it's like, okay, they understand that there's no counter position between having a social conscience and wanting to be successful on the field of play. All right, that concludes our afternoon session. Let's go ahead and have a round of applause oh. for Dave. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure there are many of you who still have questions or would like to introduce yourself to Dave. We're gonna have a meet and greet reception right next door. Uh, there's more food, <laughs> a no-host bar, non-alcoholic drinks. So please come join us next door. Marissa had a question. Thank <laughs> you.